Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for being with us. Um, I, I would like to start by honestly uh, thanking the leadership of uh, the World Cocoa Foundation for um, putting the question of prices on top of the agenda of this partnership meeting. Um, when I started this, this job at the ICCO four years ago, I must say there was very little conversation on prices. Mm. Um, my, I remember my, my first uh, conferences talking about deforestation and climate change, talking about uh, child labor, uh, environmental sustainability, social responsibilities, sometimes a little bit about living income, but never making the link between prices and living income. So I think it's a great opportunity today to go a little bit deeper in the uh, conversation on the link between prices and living income. And we have a very rich panel uh, made of, first of all, um, Yuka Wartz. She is a senior researcher at Wageningen University. She is the author of uh, several articles on cocoa, cocoa prices, cocoa farmers, living income, and she will tell us a few things about maybe what science can tell us uh, about this relationship between price and living income. Then we will have uh, Anthony Fontaine. I don't think you need to be introduced. If everybody knows you. Uh, Anthony is the managing director of the Voice Network, a network of civil society organizations um, advocating for cocoa sustainability and in particular uh, farmers' uh, living income. Um, then we will have Pamela Thornton. Uh, Pam is probably the only one on this stage who is selling and buying cocoa. Mm, that's quite important. <laughs> she's, she's a physical trader, um, and she's also, she has been advising uh, a lot of trading houses on uh, their operations uh, everywhere in the world, not only uh, Africa, but also Latin America and Asia. And finally, we will have uh, Christophe, Christophe Alio from Le Basique. Uh, Christophe is the director of Le Basique. Uh, Le Basique is, a, I think, a cooperative company uh, producing economic studies and e economic analysis on um, different food products. And uh, he's been the author of two very interesting uh, studies on the distribution of value across the chain between the farmers and the uh, European consumers, one study in France and another study in Germany. Um, well, I, I would like to, to start by uh, very briefly <coughs> setting uh, the, the scene about uh, the relationship between prices and living income. Uh, we have heard this morning several times references to uh, living income. Uh, it has become indeed a uh, a very important objective, uh, a common objective for everyone, but the link between this living income and the prices is, is, is difficult. Um, I must say there have been, I would say, maybe maximum five, five major uh, events uh, in the cocoa sector in terms of discussions, reflections. I think we have seen the um, national uh, sustainability platform in Europe, you know, GISCO, Swissco, and then later on with Belgium, uh, the Netherlands and France joining the whole process, setting up an, an alliance for living income, where the link with the living income and the prices was clearly made. Um, we have seen also in the ICCO, the uh, International Cocoa Organization, um, strategic plan of action, uh, much more emphasis put on the link between uh, cocoa uh, prices and living income. That was in 2019. Then, of course, we have seen the lead. The lead, uh, you all know what the lead is, the living income differential. That was clearly an, an attempt for the origin countries, uh, and the two biggest producers, Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana, to use the argument of very low living income to uh, require a higher price, uh, a higher farm gate price, or price paid by um, the uh, buyers um, in order to achieve this living income. Um, then we have seen the cocoa talks, uh, the EU cocoa talks. Um, uh, 
um, between the European uh, Commission and the European Union institutions and the two largest uh, countries, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana at the beginning, and then joined by uh, Cameroon, and we are all reading in the press that Nigeria may join as well the whole process, where again this question of prices and, and living income has been, uh, the relations has been made. And then we, we heard, uh, I think it was Chris in his introductory speech referring to the economic pact. Ah, oh, no, it was Jerry, sorry. It was Jerry uh, on the economic pact um, called by uh, the parties in, in Abidjan. Uh, again, um, uh, I believe that will be a good uh, framework to work towards uh, higher prices. No, I'm going to turn to uh, the panelists. Um, I would like to ask them, each of them, they have a s short presentation. Um, we will, uh, they will focus on, uh, I would say, the description of, of, of the issue, uh, prices and the link with the living income. Um, and then we will have, so each of them, you will have your presentation, and then we will have a second round of discussion um, to ask more concretely what we can do together. Mm? I think we have been discussing those issues now for a very long time. It's another attempt to discuss again this, this issue. Um, so what can we concretely propose uh, in this spirit of partnership and joint collaboration? So, Yuka, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I don't have the slide control, so... Sorry? No, it's on. Okay, I'll just start. Um, uh, before I dive into the data, because uh, that's something I would like to do uh, with you, because a lot of people, what I realize uh, when looking at the data and following the discussions, is that a lot of people have a certain perception on the household income and the living income gap, which is not necessarily the reality we see in the data, right? So one of the things I would like to call out today, if the, if the data I present is different from what you see and what you have, uh, it would be really nice to explore. Uh, together. So I think the most important point is, uh, as the start of the discussion, there are large and increasing living income gaps uh, because of uh, uh, increasing cost of production and cost of uh, decent standard of living, as you heard earlier this morning, which means that uh, households generally earn half of the living income benchmark or less. Uh, and specifically, the latter is important for the discussion, which means that at least households need $3,000 per family per year to close a living income gap for a typical family. So these are large numbers. So in total, we need billions of dollars basically to flow into the landscape one way or another uh, to close the living income gap entirely for all the families. And this is not only for cocoa, right? We see the same trends in coffee and tea, for instance. So it's not uh, only cocoa where this uh, is seen. And the question is, uh, the point is that households have the largest risk relative to the income they earn. Uh, so that's also one of the things that need to be addressed. Uh, so basically, altogether, it's not a sustainable system that works. Uh, it, it, it doesn't work for, for anyone, basically, uh, in, in, into the future. And all actors have a role to play. Um, and now we dive into prices, which is, uh, let's see how, the, oh, this is not my slide. <laughs> <laughs> so how, is this yours? <laughs> okay, let's see. Aha, uh, let's, let's see later how we do that, Pam, with your slides. Um, so basically what we will dive into today um, is look at different groups of households and what a price increase would do to their income and the living income gap. And the conclusion is already very clear. Price increases have a contribution and role to play in closing living income gaps. But especially for the poorest households, we need much more, basically. And uh, finally, I need to stress the importance of supply management measures because you wouldn't want to have a system where there's oversupply and downward pressure on prices again or households not being able to sell their cocoa, right? That's always something we need to consider. Also for yield increase uh, programs, right? Now I have a question for the audience. Uh, raise your hand if you know how much kilo a typical household produces in a year. Typical household, not the average, but preferably a typical household. In ton, it's possible in ton. Anyone? One. One thousand. Is that true? One ton, one thousand kilo. Anyone else? 
one and a half. In the back, 900. So actually, I'm pretty happy with these answers, I must say. Uh, because what we see in a lot of reports is averages, and averages are two or three or four thousand dollar per year, uh, dollar, sorry, hectares, uh, volume, sorry, uh, per year. While what we see in the data is quite a number, the typical household actually produces one thousand or less, right? And that really has a, an uh, implication on the income. So now I um, have uh, basically we go back to the data. Um, we divided the groups of households. So this is the 30% uh, households with the highest income. And highest is relative, right? Because there's still uh, households not earning a living income in this group, and we basically want mo much more than a living income. Um, to the left, you see the current price. It's based on the current farm gate price since 1 October. Uh, there's a gross coca income. There's some cost of production. And then there's some alter alternative income sources. Finally, ending up with, and I can't see that screen, uh, Six and well, almost six and a half thousand dollar, right, per year per family, which is sort of a living income on ge in general, right? Um, the, the data keeps changing every day with the inflation. Uh, so if you multiply the price by one and a half, right, you get to sort of eight thousand dollar per family per year. Still, I wouldn't consider this a lot, right? But still, uh, most of the households would earn a living income. The point is, this is the thirty percent farmers doing the best, right? And now. I need to look at the other slide, sorry. The screen just went dead here. So this is the 70% others, right? Still, you see that the average is 2,000 here, which is different what I just told you. Uh, so with uh, an, a total volume of 2,000, you end up with about $3,500 per family per year, which is half of a living income almost. Uh, if you multiply by 1.5, you get to sort of 80% of a living income, the average uh, income. Right? So it's doing a lot, so $1,400 income increase for this group. Now if we dive into, let's see, yes, uh, the typical household, which is half of the households earn this, so there's actually a lot of the households actually earning less. They end up with almost, well, a little bit more than 1500 per year per family, right? Which is 25% of living income. So basically, if you look at this data, you see the difference in implication of a price increase for the different types of households. Uh, but specifically also that, especially for the poor, poorest group, we need much more uh, than um, just price increase. But price increase remains an important one because still the, there's a quite a high uh, income increase. And then the reasons why are these households here as they are? Uh, that has to do with capacity to invest and labor to invest. It's basically the two things in the equation. Uh, and there's more in the afternoon in the produ production uh, breakout group in terms of content. Thank you. Yes. Okay, very good. So we're going to the uh, next panelists, please. Um, I think, Anthony, you have also a PowerPoint to screen. I have a few slides to show you all. Now, we've had a lot of fun sitting here because there was this timer on the screen <laughs> that was kind of counting down, <laughs> and everyone is desperately trying to solve this, but I think they've, they've managed to solve it. I often think there's not enough attention and appreciation given to the people that make technology work, so thank you guys for all your hard work. We often <laughs> tend to ignore that. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated. Um, Actually, appreciating labor is what I'm going to be talking about anyway, come to think of it. Um, let's see, where do we go? Living income approaches in cocoa. Let's talk about facts and data for a while, because a lot of this stuff about living income and price is often a gut feeling thing, right? And emotions. And those of you that know me know that I'm an emotional kind of a guy that likes to talk with passion. But I like to talk about passion, about facts. And that's what we're going to try to do here, right? Um, and I think it's very important in all of this, the data that we're showing is not my own calculations. It's really a team effort. And most of this work I've stolen from a great guy who's sitting at the back called Friedel Hoots Adams, who's doing a lot of the modeling here. This is teamwork. Um, so thank you, Friedel, for doing this. This is new stuff that we're showing you as well. If you look at the approaches to living income in the cocoa sector over the past decade, 2012, we first wrote about living income as the key requirement that needs to happen in the first cocoa barometer I wrote, released at the first World Cocoa Conference back in Abidjan 10 years ago. We said we need a living income. And what we've seen in the last decade is more and more focus on this. 
But the biggest part of the conversation is around, oh, but the farms need to have higher yields, and the farms are too small to be economically viable. Now, we hear that a lot, and we actually heard it this morning as well. Interestingly enough, we need to look at the facts about whether these facts back these ideas and these assumptions, because these are assumptions. And I would like to point out today that these assumptions might not be true. But like Yuka just said, this data is not complete. And there's a lot of stuff that we don't know yet. And so, as always, the same caveat for the last 10, 15 years. If you have other data, if you have better numbers, come to us, challenge us, because that's the only way this conversation gets better, right? But let's look at yields. This is what we're looking at right now. Higher, the current hect kilos per hectare, about 550 kilos per hectare uh, in Cote d'Ivoire and in Ghana, and that's probably already on the optimistic side, is bringing in about half of a living income to the average household, right? This is not the median household, and so what Yuka says, for the most farmers, the reality is even a lot worse. But what happens if you increase the yield per hectare? That is what you see in the green and in the brown bars in those two countries. The net income does not really go up at all. And the reason for that is that growing more cocoa requires more labor. And labor is not free. Labor is also not infinite. A household has about two adults. And you're going to have to ask them to do the work. But also, if you look at, for example, the anchor methodology on living income, they say 40% of the time of one of those two adults needs to be spent on household activities, right? And there's also an issue of gender equality there, that you can't expect a household to spend 100% of its available adult labor time in growing the cocoa. So you've got about 1.6 adults per household that can do this work. If you think that that labor is free, or an infinite, then you're going to have to find other pots of magical labor. It's not really strange that the cocoa sector has a problem with child labor, does it? If we think that labor is free, we're going to find free labor sources. Higher yields do not increase net income. I'd love to go into more nuanced detail. We'll do that a little bit tomorrow in a breakout session as well. A lot of you will disagree with this in principle, but let's talk about the numbers here. Higher yields do not increase net income, but we've also modeled what does increase net income, and it's not going to be a surprise, but this is what happens if you raise the price across the board. You go from $1.50 a ton, which is already optimistic here, right? Let's say you go up 50% to $2.25. All of a sudden, households, regardless of how much cocoa they're growing, go up to about 65 to 70% of a living income. And if you get the price to about $3 per kilo, you actually start getting a lot closer to a living income. Higher yields in all of these scenarios are agnostic to the level of income a farm is earning. The only thing that really matters is the price that you are paying in this context. Now, I'm not disagreeing with Yuka at all. There's a lot of farmers out there for which a lot more is needed, and we'll get to that in detail in this session. But what I am saying here is if you don't raise farm gate prices, you're not going to raise the income of farmers. And then comes the argument, but what about bigger farms, right? What about bigger farms? We need bigger farms. And yes, we do. But interestingly enough, this is going away from the previous slide was in Cote d'Ivoire about three hectares and in Ghana about two hectares, which according to most of the data supplied to us for the cocoa barometer by a lot of the companies here in this room is about the current realistic farm size that, that, that is being grown. Let's say you could get bigger farms of four hectare, and that's a big if, right? Because we're talking about land and tenure reform. We're talking about massive changes in the country. But let's say you could get to four hectares. Still, higher productivity doesn't solve the problem, and higher prices get you up a lot quicker. Now, why did I choose four hectares and not the five to nine that was mentioned this morning? Once again, because labor is not free and labor is finite. And if you want to put a bigger farm, you're going to have to hire labor. And if you want to make sure that you're part of a living income for that hired labor, you're going to have to pay them a living wage. And so basically, that's kind of that negates itself to a large extent. And so if we want to talk about getting to a living income, we also need to talk about the amount of available labor that is there. Now, that is a huge gap in the data that we have. 
these numbers around how many labor days per hectare do you need to get there are not assumptions that we make there based on questions that we've been asking the industry for years now. And a lot of you have replied and given us input. So these are kind of realistic labor days that you guys have told us that you think is necessary to get from 550 to 800 to 1,000. So these aren't our assumptions. These, this is the data provided by companies. Available labor is the key constraining factor. And as long as that is the case, and in a sector with a lot of child labor, I would say this is something we need to take a lot more seriously. As long as that is the case, we're going to have to look at price. Higher yields and bigger farms are not the way, and that means if you look at this from a due diligence approach, the current approach isn't working. And if you want to be diligent, and I want it to be a due diligence, you're going to have to come up with new solutions. Now, this is a little bit of a joke, you know, this whole thing, ah, this is a pity, it's not working. We need to think of some of the outside uh, the box solutions, but what's in the box is what we don't talk about. What's in the box, and it's a pity that the colors don't work, is paying the farmers more. <laughs> so, um, and this is necessary. We don't talk about paying the farmers more because this is actually the reality. This is the trend of the cocoa price over the past 70 years. We're almost done. This is the trend of the cocoa price over the last 70 years. It goes down and down and down and down and down. And this is the reality of cocoa farmers. What we need to do is we need to look Yes, at good agricultural practices, an important part of the conversation, but we also need to look at the enabling environment at the bottom of this, which is good governance policies and is good purchasing practices. What we have done for the last 20 years is only look at good agricultural practices to solve the problems. If I look at all of the company solutions, every single program is about what the farmer needs to do to get himself out of poverty. There is very little fundamental change in the core business of the company because none of your core business is to run sustainability programs. Your core business is to buy cocoa and to sell chocolate. That's the core business and that's where you need to reform how you are operating. And this is where I say, you know, what if for the next two years as sector, we continue our good agricultural practices programs, but we stop talking about that. And what if for the next two years we talk about the enabling environment? We talk about the good governance policies that we need. There's a whole bunch of those that I can talk about, but all the people that need to hear that aren't in the room, so I'd be preaching to the converted. Right? Supply management, rural agricultural policy, transparency of tax income, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, important, but they're not here, so let's not mention that. You guys are here, right? It's, it's a shame that there's not more of the big chocolate companies at this stage because I'd love to have that conversation with you guys. We need to talk about good purchasing practices with you guys. We need to talk about how much are you willing to pay your farmers, but also how are you willing to de-risk your farmers, right? Because farmers run all the risk. Longer-term contracts, asymmetrical contracts that give you more responsibility and that takes some of the responsibility away from the companies. It's also about timely payments. If you set a contract in April for the forward sales, and you agree with the cooperative that you're going to buy the cocoa in October. You take off the cocoa in December or January, but you don't pay for it until April of the next year. With a currency devaluation of 42% in Ghana, who is actually earning all the money in the, cocoa, in the currency devaluation? Probably won't only be the companies. There's a lot of transparency we need from the Ivorian and Ghanaian government about how they're getting their revenues and how they're spending that. But there's a real responsibility for your core business, which is the buying of cocoa and the selling of chocolate. And so I've got one question to every single company in this room. If you care about living income of farmers, are you also willing to change your purchasing practices? Because that is what we need to talk about. Thank you very much, Anthony, for this very punchy presentation. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot to mention we will have plenty of time to take questions from the audience, right? So we start with the, all the presentation, but we will open the floor soon. So Pam. Hello. I don't disagree with anything my uh, <laughs> pan fellow panelists have said, but I think we need to inject a degree of realism into the argument, and that's what I'm about to do, hopefully. I do not believe cocoa is transformative. It's not like the oil industry that can bring construction, all sorts of other things to the table. I do think that the creation of the, the dialogue between the EU and the governments, and when we're talking living income, 
we are effectively talking largely about West African living income. We don't have much problem in the rest of the world, I would say. And I would say that there are certain things that um, by making a partnership between the EU and African countries and hopefully US and other people, we will start to get more visibility and accurate data and that will enable us to make policy decisions. There are certain things that are obvious, obvious ones to focus on. I think land tenure reform is especially important and that allows farms not necessarily to uh, acquire more land for an individual farmer, but farmers being able to pull together to do things which we're not seeing at the moment. A cooperative, as most of you know, is, is not what we would refer to in the West as a cooperative. It's not an arrangement where the farmers pull their resources. I also think we can encourage, at the moment, there's rather nationalistic policies, particularly in Ivory Coast, not in Ghana for this particular uh, question, where you should allow the cocoa industry to be more involved in the inter interior so that they're in a position to build warehouses and contribute to the infrastructure in, in Cote d'Ivoire, whereas at the moment they're effectively uh, allowed to operate at the port level but not penetrate in land. And I've taken some flack for this, but I do think we need to improve the fiscal and structural efficiency of what we're doing. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a country collecting taxes from the cocoa sector, but in a general sense, those taxes should devolve to the central government, whereas in Cote d'Ivoire and Ivory Coast, it's really in the province of the cocoa regulators what they do with that money. And you could ask the question when talking about living income for cocoa farmers, what about cashew farmers? What about coffee farmers? Focus in on one individual segment and saying taxation should be reserved for them feels inherently wrong. I also want to pay some attention to the backdrop of what's the problem, if you like, or the root of the problem in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. We have experienced massive increase in acreage. It started in Ghana in the 80s and basically stopped when we got around 2000. Uh, when we'd more or less run out of um, national forests. And at that point, it was accelerating in Ivory Coast. It began in the mid-80s when we had a big famine and drought in, in Mali and Burkina Faso. But it's continued, and obviously the pace is down, which we should be pleased for, but the reality is there aren't many forests left. So we don't have the same amount of acreage that we could take. So we also need to recognize that it's, it's effectively um, no income or a low income. It's not a question of a living income for a lot of people. There aren't choices about what else they do. And however poor this is, a lot of the people around these in the same communities of them are equally poor. So again, a focus on, on cocoa farmers specifically doesn't seem just. When we also look at, uh, at the composition of the farmers, it's not the case in Ghana, but you know, in Ivory Coast, I used a figure the other day and I'll stand by it, at least 65% of farmers in Ivory Coast are of Burkina origin. And if you look at the national income of Burkina Faso and Mali, there's a constant magnet of people being drawn into Ivory Coast and to start cocoa farming because it's better income for them. So. It might not be a living income, but it's still a better one. <coughs> that you might look at your own, uh, in your own time. Um, <coughs> I feel that, and I don't want to sound like an apologist here, I am not happy about the, the state of the living income for people, and I do think this is a development economics things we're talking about. But when I hear the marketplace being blamed for it, that it's, it's something that needs to, you know, evil speculators, rich traders, et cetera. The market's not going away, and the market is necessary. One of the features of a commodity that has a, an exchange or multiple exchanges is it allows transparency and it allows people to engage in buying forward things that are essential for their business. It's a sign of sophistication when you have these tools and we should be grateful we have them in our market. Some commodities like vanilla, like nuts, for example, because of various characteristics, can't have these. 
So my view is you should, it's like saying, I wish iPhones weren't here. They've changed the world. The market is there, and we should be trying to use it to the benefit of the origins, not trying to pretend it doesn't exist or it's evil. Um, Anthony had his price for the last 50 years. Um, that is true, that prices were much higher in the 70s. But in the 70s, we had a commodity boom. Uh, sugar was 64 cents a pound. Since it's never been over 40 cents, it went down to two and a half cents. So I would say what we have in cocoa is a relatively stable market, somewhere between $22 and $2,500. And that has persisted for 10 years. <clears throat> you can see on the graph, there were times when it was over 3,000. That's when we had the Ebola crisis and we had a particularly severe weather season in, in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. But this is the reality. The reality is that over these 10 years, cocoa supply and demand are more or less in balance. And cocoa is a single use commodity. It's not like corn or sugar you can use for energy as well as food. The only reason we have cocoa is to eat chocolate. It's a tiny proportion that's used elsewhere. So the marginal cost at which we have demand, we, we could fantasize it would be $4,000 a ton, but the reality is it's not going to be when we're holding stocks of more than 2 million tons and when we are generally producing about what we need or a little bit more. Gonna flick over that. You can see some origins are expanding. Ecuador, Cameroon, Ivory Coast has been a big expansionary area despite the paucity of the living income. Whoops. Now I'm going to turn to the lid. Again, people won't like this. Um, it was a good idea. The concept is a good idea that having a large position um, you can influence prices. But it wasn't, it didn't take into account, again, the reality of the market, which is a five million ton crop, but we're holding more than two million tons in stocks. And it also doesn't acknowledge that Ivory Coast and Ghana have no means to support that price. They're not financially able to support it, and they don't have the physical infrastructure in Ivory Coast and Ghana to hold the cocoa. So, trying to also decouple the means by which people hedge and take transfer price risk is why the thing has, has failed effectively. That's why it's failed in the short term as well. And it has failed because if you look at the data that they themselves have produced, the prices that they have got would indicate that they're getting, in the case of Ivory Coast, possibly $200 more than, than the world world price. In the case of Ghana, it looks like they're getting less. So it was conceived from a, a misapprehension of the way the markets work. This, unfortunately, I've got a typo in here. This is my lit gap, and the second column is the brands, major brands, the bean equivalent usage, which I estimate to be actually 2.4 million of uh, beans for chocolate and about 300,000 for powder. If you then look at what the rest of the world produces, column three, and then look at the stocks, they have four million tons available to them, which means they can satisfy their needs of 2.4, and there's still 1.7 million tons left. So even if they don't buy Ivory Coast and Ghana cocoa, they can survive. Supply side characteristics are part of, the, part of the solution, part of the picture. But I feel that the, the way to deal with things in the short term is to undertake a modernization of the marketing strategies designed to achieve higher pricing. And here, I think it's sensible to have a seasonal or monthly farmer price. I think it's helpful to have a cost of production index maintained by a third party so that you have a kind of moral guideline for things. I think we should outlaw the concept of mass balance in sourcing, which has allowed what some people would call cheating, but it's effectively within the rules. When you have, you can have certificates or you can have programs in Ivory Coast, 
and seemingly be supporting the activity there, and yet you can apply those to cocoa sourced more cheaply elsewhere in the world. That's been going on the last two years. It's been going on longer than that. Um, I also believe the origin should be focusing just on flat price. This is what sellers in Nigeria, Ghana, Ecuador all focus on. Differentials are actually a tool for traders. It's a, it's a relationship between a futures price and a cash price. And Ivory Coast and Ghana aren't using futures prices. So to connect it in some way with differentials is, it's like mumbo jumbo. It's not understood what a differential is, I feel. I also think the policy of selling forward, it made sense when forward prices were higher. So when you had a 150 pound premium in a market, which was 2,000 pounds, it made sense to try and capture that 150. But the price is flat and has been for some time. So why would you give industry the comfort of having price cover when you're not getting any benefit from it? It is better to move more towards the spot price. I also think they should take advantage of the huge liquidity that's there in futures markets, not just futures, options and other derivatives, and, and sell through that medium. It's a huge marketplace. And if you go back to that chart of price, there were still opportunities for them to sell. So this last two years, there's still been chances to sell there at 2700, 2750. But what happened is when a market got up there and then they wanted $400 on top, nobody was interested. So to take advantage of those market moves, you need to be set up to, to follow futures and options and to engage with them. And you can also sell options forward, which is where you can monetize your ability to have a crop constantly coming behind you. So for example, yesterday you could get roughly $200 a ton by selling an at-the-money option for July next year. As an origin, you sell it, you sell the market, you sell the option, and you have a $200 cushion. If the market goes up, you have more cocoa, so you get a higher price on more stuff that you sell. If the market goes down, you have that $200 extra in your pocket. Um, that use of activity, getting involved in the marketplace in a more commercial way, will help strengthen local banking and build up a financial sector in origins, which is obviously helpful for everybody. And lastly, you can get on the boards of all these publicly traded companies like Nestle and Hershey and Mondelez and ask questions. And this is something that Ivory Coast and Ghana should be using yeah. some of their money. I'm not advocating much, but they should be present on these asking questions. And that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Pam. I think uh, we must thank you for a lot of uh, very interesting thoughts. Um, you have already started making proposals. What's next? I will come back to that. Um, so, um, Christoph, Christoph, it's up to you. Thank you very much, uh, Michel, and everybody in the room. Very happy to be with you today. I. I will do a bit differently. I will not have any slides. You've had quite a lot so far. And I'll be very quick for my first uh, part of the presentation. And uh, I will add on with just one or two things that uh, my colleague will help me uh, show up in the second round. Uh, for the first round, what is the link with what we've done? Well, as an introduction, I would say that, uh, well, following on your, your invite, uh, we've had a look at not only what is happening at, at international commodity market level or producing countries, but we've extended the scope and the look at the rest of the chain to see and research is there a role for the rest of the chain back to what is happening at origin and trying to, as you said, Anthony, I think we are quite in line, put facts and figures as best as we could on this uh, uh, very complex topic. So just one word to say we are uh, a research institute, independent research institute based in Paris, as uh, Michel said, uh, constituted as a cooperative. And we have been working for the past 10 years on the issue of how value is created, how it is distributed uh, along the chains, uh, in the food sector mainly, but not only, and also researching the uh, profound link that there is between structures of value chains 
business models of private actors, companies, regulation, public regulation, and the social health environmental impact. Um, we conducted over the past four years two, uh, we believe, innovative studies, not only on how value is distributed, but also costs, internal costs at each stage of the cocoa chocolate chain, tax, public tax, and net margin. And the reason for that, for that is the fact that having a big chunk of value doesn't mean that you have a high profitability. It depends on the cost. And it's not just for farmers, it's all along the chain. And also, of course, the issue of public tax and, and what is left uh, for the business and for the rest of, of other areas of activities beyond cocoa and chocolate sometimes. Uh, so we conducted that study for mainly for the chocolate tablet uh, market. So these 100 grams and 200 grams bars um, that you have in the French market sold in retail chains and German retail and discount chains. Uh, the French study was published 2020 and we've just published a few, three, four weeks ago, uh, the second study on Germany. Before telling you some of the key results, uh, first thing to understand is in order to get into this very sensible to sensitive sorry, topic, we our research is based on modeled products that are as close as reality as possible, but not revealing any business secret at all. That would be anti antitrust law or competition law. So the way we work is a heavy uh, work of modeling, uh, relying on all the possible databases, public databases that exist at different points in the chain, from farmers to end consumers. So we go all along the chain till the end, and a very intense process of dialogue and interviews with people all along the chain that we have conducted in the two studies and uh, with the, the, the support of uh, not only institutions, European Commission, FAO, um, the uh, German cooperation in the case of the German study, but also the, the support of the actors themselves and, and, and GISCO uh, uh, in, in the case of Germany lately. So what are the facts and what have we found together with all these actors? Well, mainly that there is very little correlation along the chain. If you look from end to end between what happens at the farm gate and producer level, and even at the international commodity level, and what happens at the very end of the chain. We have very detailed estimates. And what it shows is that there are major variations of value creation and value distribution at the end of the chain. I think you all know that in the room. Uh, but it first and foremost depends on factors that are situated at the end of the chain. It's about marketing, and we can have average prices to consumer in retail and discounters that are uh, from one to three. So it can be multiplied by three if you're in the premium segment compared to the very low range, you know, see, you know the, 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 the low price level. Uh, there are especially in the middle of the public debate in this current context of inflation. So we can have quite high variations. But not only that, it's also the structure of the chain. We have very different, not only end value, price to consumers, but also the structure and the way value distributed between the value chains of national and international brands and the private label, the, the own brands of retailers or discounters. Nothing to do one with the other, starting with the price to consumer that can be half in the case of private labels, on average in France and Germany. And everything changes from that. Last point, the pricing strategies of the retailers at the end of the chain and, and the way they are set in connection with their uh, suppliers, whether they are brands or the manufacturers of their private label, has a very heavy role also uh, in, in the value distribution, value creation, where we're talking about not entering into details, but the best seller strategies we have in France, which is very different from the line approach that we have in Germany. And that ends up for this last factor, in fact that uh, in certain products, well, you have actually, when you count for all the internal costs at each step of the chain, you have losses. In France, it can be losses for the retailer, for some categories of product, sometimes for the brands. In case of Germany, it's, it's most of the time for, for the brands because of the line approach. And this is what our, our figures demonstrate. And what is the connection with what we've just seen before is that all these big variations that are heavily influencing the structure of the value chain and the results, as I was saying, are very, very little correlation with what happens at, at farm gate, but also at export level. 
Not to say that there are not variations, but nothing to do with what we see at the end of the chain. And that's the way the, the, the system works, the economic system works at the moment. So how to reconnect uh, the two, and I will go, go uh, on this in, in my, my second speech. Maybe just the last conclusion. We are only talking about price level. But there is another one that other speakers have touched upon that is very clear when we see the full value chain, is the issue of variations and volatility. We have very little volatility. We had, so far, very little volatility for consumers in our countries, which is very clearly the case in France and Germany. Of course, the inflation is coming by, but even then, we have quite of a buffering happening at the end of the chain because of the structure that has been developed in between all the actors compared to the volatility we have at farm gate and export level. We have a volatility that is multiplied by 5 to 10 when you're looking at what is happening from one year to the other and within a year at the farm and export level. And it had nothing to do with the rest. So we have a chain that is made to protect consumers and get the cheapest possible price for the best quality. This is what it's all about. And how to reconnect that to what is happening at the, at the very beginning. This is one of the issues I will touch upon in the second round. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we are now at the, the second round of intervention. I think we have about 10 minutes and then we will open the floor. Um, I would like you to, each of you, to maybe to make concrete proposals, pragmatic proposals, how to achieve better price. Hello, hello. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, how can we practically uh, make um, proposals to uh, achieve uh, our objectives? Um, but uh, we could summarize that by how can we create value, right? Um, I think the the conclusion of the cocoa talks were that well, we will soon have a new cocoa. For this new cocoa, we need a new price, right? We will have a sustainable cocoa. Uh, sustainability and prices are sides of the same coin. Mm? So how is that uh, new legislation about due diligence, etc., creating responsibilities in terms of sustainability, translate into higher prices? Because that sustainability has a price. Right? I translated that by saying, well, we don't want a bigger share of the cake for the farmers, we want a bigger cake. If we have a bigger cake, you know, it's a very classical technique of negotiation. When you, you don't agree, well, you make the deal bigger. Perhaps you will find a solution for a bigger deal, right? So we cannot find a solution to give a bigger share to the farmers of the cake. Let's make a bigger cake. Hmm? So um, up to you, each of you, and in any any turn. Maybe we can start with, with Yuka. Yeah. <laughs> I just gave it to my neighbor. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there, there are several things. The question is, isn't the cake uh, good enough? But I don't have all the data, so that's why I hope uh, Anthony will, uh, will give some answers to that. I think already there's more possible. That, that's how it feels, right? So I, I'm a scientist, so I should uh, base my conclusions on, on data and ev evidence. Uh, but what we do see is that there is a big role for prices in sort of increasing income significantly, but not the only one. And I think that's why we, need the, we don't need to stop in the discussion in prices. Right, so we, it needs to be a combination of several things which we need to talk to, uh, talk about. Okay. So, but maybe Anthony has a. And one of them could be supply management, for instance. Well, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question because by supply management, it will it will help, right? But it won't also achieve living incomes, right? So I was mm -hmm. rather thinking about wider economic development, so households actually have a choice where where they earn an income, which is not happening. I think Pam showed it very clearly. So people don't have a choice, they're stuck, basically. Mm -hmm. And they won't improve the, the typical households, right? The lowest pr producing households, they won't improve in terms of yield easily. We have, well, at least we haven't seen that a lot in the data uh, and the evidence in the literature. So then the only thing that's left to really help these poorest households, which are really urgent uh, in the terms of the situation they're in, is a higher prices. It's a direct sort of transfer of value mm -hmm. um, and social protection measures. So that's the, the, basically, that's where we're cash at. Cash transfer, at the Cash, cash transfer. transfer, yeah, but it could be by uh, the governments or by companies or by NGOs. Uh, the 
there could be a conspiracy of, uh, of parties. But prices is definitely one where you can, and then the question is, where does it come from, right? Mm -hmm. So what we see is there's a difference between what we see in the market price and what the farm gate prices are. I don't know how, for how much money the tons are actually bought, right, by the companies. So the question is, how does the, the translation from the market price, if it's paid, uh, to the to the farm gate price, how does it happen? So the government also has a role to play there. So there's basically multiple parties where there there may be value which can be reshared, but we really don't know necessarily. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Thank you. Th there are so many things to do, right? There's anyone that believes that there's a single magic bullet that solves this problem you know, is 20 years late to the game. You know, a lot of us, I'm seeing so many faces that we've been seeing in these meetings for, <laughs> well, wait, back when I still had hair, if you look at the picture. Um, um, <laughs> supply management is part of it, but I think we need to be nuanced about how much supply management can work. Because there's a very asymmetric way that the price goes up or down depending on a surplus or a deficit. We're in a deficit at the moment. But you wouldn't tell that if you'd be looking at what the market price is doing. And the reason for that, as Pam rightly points out, you know, there's half a year's supply in stocks alone. So, um, you know, kind of, that's not going to help much to drive the prices up. But you know what does help to drive the prices down? <laughs> an overshoot. And this is what we see happen time and again. And so there's a very asymmetric way that the price collapses, but also because, and I kind of disagree with Pam, we're not at a level of balance between supply and demand. We're at a continuous slide over production, which is great for all of you guys because it keeps the prices down. It's really crap for the farmers. And so over the long term, we need to go to a point where supply management has to be a part of the solution. And to be honest, there is a whole pile of naivete and self-delusion and politics and wishful thinking around supply management at the governmental levels, right? There's like Cote d'Ivoire that are saying, you're not allowed to do anything for productivity increase. And in the meantime, they allow all these trees to be cut down. And so you can't increase on your farm, but you can kind of cut down the rainforest. There's a problem there. On the other hand, you've got Ghana that says, oh, we want to become the biggest cocoa producer in the world again. And every year you see their production go down for a whole bunch of reasons, right? And then you've got people like Peru and Ecuador that's saying, oh, it's not me. Like They're shaggy. And at the same time, they're increasing their production year by year. Now, we're having conversations internally in civil society. But I think it's not even a crazy prediction to say that it might be that by the end of this decade, Ecuador has overtaken Ghana in production. So we need to look in supply management. What's the role of Latin America? in this as well, because there they have governments that are actively promoting the production of cocoa in a way that works, because they are putting in place the infrastructure, they're putting in place a lot of the systems in a way that we're not seeing in West Africa. So yes, supply management, but not as a be-all, end-all, and it needs to be more honest. But we can talk about supply management as long as we want. There's this thing that, interestingly enough, after the 2015 cocoa barometer, the Dutch government released a uh, a research based on our barometer where we said we need to look at value distribution in the supply chain and we need to look at market power and how that affects pricing. And the research there showed actually market power doesn't influence pricing very much at all because there's a lot of countervailing power. Nestle and Mondelez, sorry, I'm saying this because I see you sitting here. They have a lot of power, and Gallabout and Olam also have a lot of power because they buy and sell from each other. Supply and demand and the market works quite well across the whole breadth of the supply chain. And there was this footnote in the paper that says, oh, by the way, the farmers have absolutely zero market power, so we didn't look at what that does to them, which was the whole purpose of the research. So whether or not you look at supply management, which is supply and demand, is completely irrelevant for our conversation in the first place, which is what about the price the farmer gets? And Christoph's research is really important there because what he's actually saying, it doesn't matter how much we pay the farmers, you can still sell your chocolate. Right? And so I think the first question that we have is before we talk about what are the mechanisms, is to just acknowledge, let's get to the plate and let's start paying the farmers more. Because if you care about poor farmers, and I say this all the time because it's not rocket science, if you care about people being poor, 
give them more money. It really is quite simple. And when we do that, then we can have a big conversation about how are we going to do that. And that's when people like Pam come in that really understand how markets work. I am a complete idiot where it comes to how markets work, but I do understand how living income and pricing works at farm gate level, and we need to solve that, and I think the market will solve the rest of it if we're paying the farmers enough. Okay. Thank you. Pam. I mean, I've got some good news to deliver in that I think we're at close to the end of a, a large uptrend in global supply. Although I recognize that at these sort of price levels, you are seeing expansion in, in Ecuador, for example, and Cameroon. So you do have to be aware that even if we, if we stop increasing production and we go into deficit situation, you're going to induce some people at those price levels to grow more. But I think with the large coming to the end of deforestation, because there isn't any forest left effectively in the, in the productive zone, that will turn off the tap in a big way. And we will have an environment that is more conducive to higher cocoa prices. Um, Can I ask a question there? Because what about the Congo Basin? And what about the yeah. Amazon Basin? The Congo and Uganda, Tanzania, all of those are attracted by cocoa at this point. And there's a huge amount of forest, particularly in Democratic Republic of Congo and that, which could be the next frontier. So that is up to us now to, to protect that. But in, in terms of the backdrop, I think we're kind of coming to the end of a of a cycle, and it might take another five years before we sort of go down the other side of plateau. I will say we've been talking about structural deficit for 20 years because we did see incidents of disease in Ivory Coast and Ghana so prevalent, we thought the crops were going to deteriorate. We weren't banking on how much a 1,000 CFA price did. I mean, I remember being in Cote d'Ivoire, I guess it was 2015, 16 season when they announced a farmer price of a thousand CFA and literally everyone you met said I'm gonna grow cocoa I'm I'm gonna start planting I need to get it in the ground so despite by our analysis it not being a comfortable living income compared to what else they had these price levels are not necessarily unattractive to everyone and now what you describe in terms of okay the farmer should have more which again, no one can argue with that concept, but where is it to come from? Is it to come from the private sector in a, in a capitalist society? Are companies gonna say, yeah, we'll unilaterally decide to pay more? They're in a competitive business too. Chocolate competes against snack foods, blah, blah, blah. So do we really expect companies, and don't forget we have equity in them in our pension funds and everything else, do we ex expect them to make a charitable contribution to the cocoa sector? Or do we expect our governments to do that? And do you then have a situation where, why aren't we paying our nurses more? Because we're giving money to another cause, which is helping farmers. So imagining that we can just legislate a price increase without, without, you know, unless it's made a rule or a law somewhere, I don't see it happening. I see it necessary for us to be more proactive and looking at what we can do, which is encouraging Ivory Coast and Ghana to modernize their economies. And maybe that is something we can do in foreign aid, give, you know, 200 million to improve uh, roads in Ivory Coast or something to that effect. But imagining people are just going to say, yeah, we'll pay more, and, and implementing it. And again, I'm going to say one of the facts that I think origins don't understand is that only a little over half of cocoa is in the hands of branded companies. So, you know, naming and shaming only goes so far. Half of the world is not branded. <laughs> and is using stuff, and they're oblivious to what goes on in these type of environments. So, you know, figuring that you can put pressure by naming and shaming on big companies, again, you're only seeing half of the big picture. So, and 
looking at the value chain, again, I don't argue that the farmer only gets 6% or, or whatever the number is for, for the price of the cocoa component in chocolate. But again, this is the same as, you know, potato chips, biscuits, all sorts of processed foods. We're not unique. This isn't, when we look at our own sector, we tend to become myopic. Oh my God, 6%, it's dreadful. Go out and compare it with everything else that we're eating, cereal, dairy. I mean, dairy farmers all over the world need support because the, the infinitesimal price that they're getting for their milk. So we need to stop like turning inward and look outward, I think. And one of the negatives, I want to mention it now about about price support and controlling supply, you know, there are optics to that too. Having put in place the lid, you had a situation where although the government mandated price in Ivory Coast was, you know, 800 CFA, farmers everywhere were getting 450, 500, 600. The government was not in a position to enforce the 800 CFA because no one would buy the beans. And if that happened, you'd have piles of beans building up up country and farmers would be getting nothing and the cocoa would be spoiling. So, you know, we need to, the, the biggest thing that's necessary for me is honesty from both sides as to what's going on and reality. This is the case, we need to do this, we need to tax this, we need the money for this. How can you help us bridge the gap? But as long as we're in kind of airy fairy land, that's why we're still sitting here 20 years on, having accomplished virtually nothing. Pam, Pam. Okay, thank you, Pam. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, let's, let's give a second chance to, yeah. to Christophe. I think you have a, a short presentation. I, I will, uh, first of all, uh, I will draw on or build on what has been said. Uh, try to be less pessimistic than Pam, that there might be things that can be done. Uh, well, I'm going to present you two things. Uh, be very humble, because what you see here is not finalized. The numbers are finalized, but not the way it's all shown. So we're still uh, working a lot with our German partners, who so don't stick to uh, entirely the way it looks, but I will show what, what we're trying to do. It's not a silver bullet, but it's meant to be something, as you said, uh, Anthony, that maybe helps discussion on prices and uh, also maybe answers your point, Pam, about is it up to the states, to the public uh, institutions, or to the private actors? Well, maybe all together. And what, what we, we try, try to do is a platform for discussing together. together. Uh, uh, I'll be very quick on that. Just to show you the concept, once again, we're changing it. This is about value distribution in the German market overall. So you have distribution at retail level, at the level of brands, cocoa and chocolate processing, all the trading, warehousing, export, and farmers in red. What is important is what you have here is estimates of the costs, the taxes, and the net margins. If we go up Mayan, and, and thanks a lot to my colleague Mayan here, that helps me on that. Um, if you go a bit upward, what is, yeah, that's where you have here. We know there are different realities and that big averages do, do not make up. So I'm not gonna show it here because of the Wi-Fi connection, but basically on this platform, and once we have a better visual uh, in here, you can just move around the different categories of products and see how different it can be when you have a product with hazelnuts that has a lot more costs in it that may not be accounted to the consumer, that creates loss to uh, to just a dark plain um, a premium, for example, chocolate tablet. So you can move around. But surely what you're gonna tell us is that uh, that's based on data from 2020 and we are in a total different world. I guess you all agree on that. So what we are building at the moment as a very first start is what we'll see in here. A simulation capacity. I'm just gonna show you one result that we've just made for launching today's discussion. Simulation capacity built on, on our model um, where we have put uh, some parameters, uh, just for you to understand. We can do simulation because we've not just put numbers in our model. We have enshrined the way each actor works and its business model. How price are set according to the cost of the supply. And we have very different logics. A retailer does not work the same as a trader, as you said, Pam, very different business model, very different from a brand. When you're a small brand or a big brand, can be also some differences, and differences between France and Germany. 
So all this is in the model. What do we change then? Well, in that trial, for example, we change, we try to account for some, it's not real numbers, I guess they are different from day to day, but it's, you know, uh, an assumption that you have the agricultural inputs that are 50% more uh, expensive at the moment, that transport costs in producer countries are also 50% higher, 200% increase in international transport. You will use an answer. It, it, I think it went up to 400%, no, depending on, on when it was. So that's just, just one assumption. Uh, you see the same in Europe, also 50% increase, 5% wage increase in Europe, packaging 80% increase, and we've put a lot of increase in terms of the sugar price, of the milk price, and if we go down, and we've, we've accounted for a 5% consumer price increase at retail level. So also the consumer price moves on. Well, if that's one possible result, I'm not saying that this is reality, but in that simulation, for example, you have less net margin for the retailer, maybe 50% less, but you have almost no margin anymore at this stage of the brand, maybe to be, to be open with you, is this the current negotiation basis with retailers? And you have also a lot of smaller margin taking place at the middle of the chain and in trading. What this is all about, this is about having a platform that hopefully try to objectify some of the facts and figures and help for discussions, dialogue. Maybe not bilateral dialogue, but more collective dialogue. And we hope that having a basis like that maybe could be a way, but open to you, for maybe wider discussions, not only for brands, but with traders, with people at producing at origin, public authorities all along the chain, and of course the retailers, I don't know if there are any out there, but they seem to be an important player for us in the chain. And what to do with it, maybe to, to finish on that, there are concrete possibilities, Pam, and I can sh show you some that we have in France, that we have studied in France. As Ma Michel said, we're not only active in cocoa, but in many other food uh, industries. In France, for the past uh, six to seven years, we have quite interesting new models taking place at, uh, at mainstream level. So we're not talking about niche. Uh, for example, in the dairy industry, which was exactly as you said, Pam, an industry where the farmer gets minimum, especially the French farmers. And for the first time in France, for the past six to seven years, uh, we have new types of agreements called tripartite agreements or memorandum of understanding between farmers, cooperatives, industry players and retailers with commitments for five years on volumes and prices at the different stages in the chain so everybody can make their living out of it. Extracting themselves from the way the international commodity market works because for the first time the price of milk was not set according to the international commodity price But as an agreement between the different stages in the chain to ensure greater stability and These kind of agreements now they account for 30% of liquid milk in France It's one way forward it has been secured by the new, uh, new French law that that is uh, fully in line with uh, the European law too so just to show that things maybe could, could uh, move forward and just an invitation maybe to, to have an inspirational discussion among us around these kind of different types of agreements, not every actor being in isolation trying to solve a problem that is bigger than everybody, but trying to be collective about it and hopefully giving you ideas on, on moving forward and welcome any question you may have. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to open the floor for questions. I will take four questions first, and then we will see. We have we have 15 minutes, I believe. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Duncan Brack. I'm facilitator of the informal Cocoa Coalition of Cocoa and Chocolate Companies, certification organizations, NGOs, and others. A question to all of the panelists. Um, the Nestle speaker this morning talked about the Income Accelerator Program, paying cocoa farmers directly, not linked to the price. And in principle, that's not very different from the way in which the EU's common agricultural policy has evolved, and other countries' farm support programs as well. So you're paying farmers for directly through income support or for environmental goals. For example, you're not linking payments to the production. Do you think there is a scope for going down that route rather than trying to manipulate prices or alongside manipulating prices for cocoa farmers? 
Thank you. We had a lady here. You, I think. Yes. You have a microphone there. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists. I'm Virginie Fugue, working for the Rainforest Alliance. So I really want to thank all of you for uh, all the insight. I will write because I write my question. Uh, for all the insight on the issue of prices, supply and demand, and this great tool that will help us understand the value distribution. However, I have a question, and I think it's for Pam. Pam, I saw all the recommendations that you gave for uh, kind of taking advantage on how the market works. And if I got it well, your recommendation was mostly for the countries. But my feeling is that as we have this crisis where farmers are grumbling, as Mrs. Uh, uh, Dao Gabala said this morning, we are having a kind of social crisis coming in. So can we at least test something? Can we try something and also bring together the industry and the government to clearly look at the pro purchase mechanism, the purchase practices all together? Can we try it or at least test it and see what happens? Can't we pay farmers a little bit more and see instead of just saying we need to do this and this? Why are we turning around what Anthony said is what is in the box, the price of cocoa? I really have this question with a lot of patience to you, Pam. Thank you. Thank you. One more question, yes. Yeah, thank you. My name is Edward. Um, I work with producers in West Africa, Fair Trade, into, uh, Fair Trade Africa. Um, the rhetoric most of this morning is about paying more, paying more. My question is to Pam and, of course, any other panelists can can address it. If we change the perspective a bit, because for me, farmers are not just asking to be paid more for wanting to be paid more, just for wanting to be paid more. The simple request is pay me enough to cover the cost of my production. You ask me to produce sustainably, it costs to produce sustainably. Pay me more to be able to produce sustainably not to cut forests, to protect human rights. If we, if we view it this way, Pam, would your position change? And I do agree with you on most of the points that you raised, um, very nice suggestions. But let's look at it from the perspective of the farmer. Just as any employer, if we engage in a conversation with your employer, your argument definitely is going to be, pay me more because I'm adding this value or because I'm expect, you are expecting me to put in this more. From the employer's perspective, if an employee is asking to be paid more, you are looking at the value add, and producers are adding value. They want to add value, and they are simply asking for that value to be met by the right price. Will this change your perspective, Pamela? Thank you. Thank you. So we take a, a last question for the first round. Yes, Max. Hello. Uh, Pam, thanks. She has too many questions. So. Yeah, and this one is not for <laughs> Pam. Sorry, Pam. Uh, this is Max from JB Coco. Uh, thank you for the panel. I have uh, one question for Antoine, uh, Anthony, and for Yuka. Uh, if you look at uh, Nigeria, for example, which is similar in terms of the production context, um, we see farm gate prices, I would say, 30 to 50% higher than in Ivory Coast in Ghana. Have you looked at that and have you found anything, the impact from that higher price? Okay. Well, let, let's start with this last question perhaps and also the question of Duncan, you can uh, elaborate on that. Yeah, so, so a lot of the conversation is about what's happening in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. And I think that too often Nigeria and Cameroon are a, kind of a blank spot on the map as far as this is concerned, and very often in Latin America as well, because let's be honest, there's also poverty in cocoa growing in other parts of the world. Now, I often say that, you know, <coughs> West African cocoa farmers wish they had the problems that Latin American cocoa farmers have, 
but that doesn't mean that Latin American cocoa farmers don't have problems, right? Where it comes specifically to Nigeria and Cameroon, this is data that is often still not available. Now, the data that we've been modeling here, we've been spending 10 years trying to find enough data to do this for Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, and we are nowhere near this kind of information around Nigeria and Cameroon, and I think it'd be very valuable. So, also a question to all of you, um, out there, um, if you do have that data, please share it with us because we do like to have as much information because we need to have fact-based conversations rather than in airy fairyland. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're in the place we're in is because of the lack of data, which is why we can have, and I don't want to be blunt here, but we can have three CEOs saying it's not only about the price. I'd be making a list of all of the sustainability interventions that are only about the price. <laughs> you could argue that the living income differential is only about the price. You could even argue that the fair trade living income reference price is only about the price. Yes, those are two. If someone could turn that off, that would be great. Um, <laughs> I can tell you which programs are not about price at all, and this is starting to come to Duncan's uh, question here. Mondelez Cocoa Life is not about price at all. Mars's impact program is not about price at all. Hershey's programs are not about price at all. Ferrero's programs are not about price at all. None of the large chocolate brand companies are about cocoa price at all, and none of the large traders, so also not Callabout, also not Cargill, also not Olam, also not Sugden, also not Blummer, none of these programs are about price at all. Gisco is not about price, Disco is not about price, Beyond Chocolate is not about price, Swissco is not about price, Frisco is not about price. The IDH roadmap on living income obliquely refers to purchasing practices, but also doesn't say you need to pay your farmer more. Not a single program out there is only about price. So when we talk about Airy Fairy, let me be very clear. Nobody is only talking about price. Nobody in the world is only talking about price. And I would love it if we could stop using that as an argument to not talk about price at all. That is really important. And that brings me to the Nestle Living Income Accelerator, which I think is a very important step forward. Because what they have done there is they've taken paying the farmers more away from the farmer growing more cocoa. And I think that that is really important because it looks at the concept of living income as a household concept and not as in how many tons of cocoa do you grow. I think that is really important. I also love the fact that it puts in place this gender equality component for half of the price they're paying. But what I don't like about it is that it is a substitute, and as Duncan said, rather than looking at price. And I've told Daryl this, so I'm very comfortable saying this very bluntly. I don't think the Living Income Accelerator program is the way forward if it doesn't also look at purchasing practices. And that is as simple as it is. All of you have something that makes you unique. And because if it wasn't unique, you wouldn't be allowed to do it from your CEO. It's as simple as that, right? You all have to differentiate yourself. But you also must change your purchasing practices. Uh, this is just my sister, or I am of the opinion that Carthage must be destroyed. I am of the opinion that you must also change your purchasing practices. Maybe, yeah, Christophe, you add, and then Pam will. Yeah, it will be very quick. I'm, I'm not going to say anything about uh, cocoa or chocolate because we've not looked at that uh, specifically, but we have made quite a lot of studies on, on the cap on the, uh, on the European Common Agricultural Policy and its impact in France. And typically, we've not in France had uh, any leverage on changing purchasing practices, just the, the common agricultural policy. And what we have seen for the past 20 years, uh, at least in France, and I, I guess it's quite common in other Western European countries, is that now we are at the point that 80% of farmers' revenue are from either the common agricultural policy or French subsidying. So Public money makes 80%. Of course, you have you know, specific timing like cereals at the moment. So it's from year to year. But given the volatility, even for them, uh, most of the time, two, three years down the line, you, you need to have some public urgency fund or whatever that comes in uh, because, because they don't stand uh, on the long term. And, and that may open a question that potentially, at least it's, it's documented in France, that unless you, you change... Uh, the way the, the chain works, that that's the public subsidy is just 
getting you know to compensate for what what is happening on on the market and once again this was uh, interestingly this was in reaction to that that in france it started with the dairy industry because our milk farmers are so much important in, in the french you know uh, just uh, conscience that it started there. <laughs> but agricultural subsidies are not a new thing. Look at history. Like if you look at history, the Roman Empire subsidized grain to go to, uh, to Italy, right? Before that, the very first economic principle ever recorded in history was Joseph, the prince of Egypt, actually subsidizing grain storage in order to provide food security in the future. Subsidizing agriculture is literally as old as the Bible. But we expect coca farmers in West Africa to be able to pull up themselves out of the mud through their own productivity. There's a huge hypocrisy there as well. Mm. Well, we still we have only five minutes, I'm afraid. So, <laughs> Pam, uh, we are not going to reopen the. Okay, table. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna take the easy question first on Nigeria and CAMS. Those origins typically are slightly discounted from Ivory Coast and Ghana. But there is no real public sector involvement. It's free market, no mandated farmer price, and there are no very little, tiny, tiny slice of taxation. So there's no taxes, effectively. <coughs> Whereas in Ivory Coast, there's a government monopoly, and there's a spread of about 30% between the price farmers get and the price they sell externally. In Ivory Coast, it's more transparent. It's, it's over 20%. And, you know, is it, it's legitimate, I think, for countries to raise taxes. It's perhaps not legitimate that the cocoa sector decides what's done with them in, in my book. Um, I'm disappointed you think I'm kind of negative because I thought my last page of my slide <laughs> was a whole list of things on the marketing side, which I feel are almost instant things we can do to, to help, to help give the farmer a better price. And I'm not negative, too, on the concept that we, we give the farmer more money directly. It's just there's a difference, say, French dairy within France is one country. We're talking about global farmers, national borders. Can it be done by companies or should it be done by countries or the EU? Yes, we could put a tax on chocolate and then give them money raised by that tax back to directly payments to farmers in Ivory Coast. We could do it with carbon emission taxes and, you know, pay into to effectively keep um, carbon neutral in Ivory Coast and that money go. But then who are you going to give it to? A government and then hope it trickles down to cocoa farmers? What about the cashew farmer? Why is a cocoa farmer a a superior citizen to other citizens in those countries. I'm just saying things aren't going to happen automatically. We do need to be honest about the magnitude of the issues and try and address them somewhat systematically and not be kind of too ambitious that it's all going to happen on its own. It's Am I sounding positive? <laughs> I, you know, I've spent my whole, I, I want to say among traders, I think I'm one of the traders who spent most time at Origin. I know all Origins pretty well, all, at least all major Cocoa Origins well. And I've always considered myself fighting the fight for the farmer. And in fact, industry hated me for years because I was. And now I seem to be depicted on the other side, on the enemy <laughs> of the farmer. So, so be it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm not sure we have achieved our objective to come with practical solutions or proposals, but at least I think we have brought some clarity in the debate, and I, I wish to thank each panelist for their contribution. And, uh, well, we will close here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.